Most people don't think their brain can change. Most people think their brain is stuck. You are not stuck. With the brain you have, you could make it better. Uh, people don't think that their brain produces 700 new baby stem cells every day. And there's an area called the hippocampus uh, on the inside of your temporal lobes. And hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. And every day you make 700 new baby seahorses, stem cells, every day. And through your behavior, you're either growing them or you're murdering them. And nobody thinks like this. Every day I'm making my brain better by what I do or I'm making it worse. Smallest thing you can do. It'll make the biggest difference. And it's just ask yourself this question every day. Um, this is good for my brain or bad for it. And if you can answer that with information and love, love of yourself, love of your family, love of the reason you're on the planet, you just start making better decisions. Give your mind a name. Uh, it's based on the concept of gaining psychological distance from the noise in your head. That's one of the ways. It's um, killing the ants, automatic negative thoughts that steal your happiness. You need to discipline your mind, train your mind to help you rather than have all my patients write down a hundred of their worst thoughts and then we take them through a process to eliminate them or at least go into them and flip them. So if you take the worst thought, my wife never listens to me, um, and then flip it, my wife does listen to me, and then go, okay, so what's really the truth? If you don't question your you believe them. And then you act as if they're true, even if they're wrong. And I want to treat myself like a good boss, a good parent, a good coach, which is I'm always firm and kind, which is, I understand this the hard day. We can do that. What's your goal? And then you just ask yourself every day, my behavior getting me what I want? And that's not selfish. I actually believe happiness is a moral obligation because of how contagious you are, right? If you've ever been raised by an unhappy parent or married to an unhappy spouse or raised an unhappy child, and you ask those people, is happiness a moral obligation? They'll say, absolutely. Hedonism, however, is the enemy of happiness. And if I know what I want, I'm caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship with my wife, then I'm always filtering what I say, what I do. Is, does it fit? It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down. Hi, I'm Maya Bialik, and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break things down so you don't have to. We've got a very exciting guest today. I'm flying solo with someone that Jonathan is so envious that I get to talk to, Dr. Daniel Amen. His mission is to end mental illness by creating a revolution in brain health. He is an author of numerous books. His most recent is change your brain every day. And it's literally an everyday guide to changing your brain. Um, he's the founder of um, Amen Clinics. They have 11 locations across the United States. It is the world's largest database of brain scans for psychiatry. He's the founder of Brain MD, a science-based nutraceutical company, and Amen University. Um, he also has, in 2020, he launched Scan My Brain, which has a ton of high-profile actors, musical artists, TikTok stars, athletes, entrepreneurs, and that's on YouTube and Instagram. And he really is a psychiatrist of an entirely other variety. I'm going to ask him all the hard questions. I'm going to ask him what psychiatry gets wrong. We're going to talk about what psychiatry can get right and what the new phase of dealing with mental health actually looks like from a psychiatric and also holistic perspective. I'm so excited to welcome to The Breakdown, Dr. Daniel Amen. Break it down. 
What an honor. Thank you for helping me spread the message about it's not mental illness, it's brain health. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, you've written so many books, um, and the most recent Change Your Brain Every Day, um, which I've really been enjoying, first of all, because you wrote this book in a way that my brain works. Um, I like a page a day. I like to kind of take things in bite-sized pieces. It's very easy to metabolize the way you present really, really big concepts. Um, and I really appreciate that. And I think a lot of our readers, uh, a lot of our listeners will also really appreciate that. Um, there's a couple things in particular I, I want to highlight from here, but, um, first I, I want to ask you a general question. Um, you know, you're a, you're a psychiatrist, you are that guy who holds that medical degree. Um, but a, a lot of people, um, feel very disillusioned by many aspects of psychiatry. Um, you know, I, I come from a time when, you know, when I first presented with mental health challenges as a teenager, this would have been in the late 80s and, and into the early 90s, you know, no one asked, what was your childhood like? What's going on in your home? What other symptoms might you be having that might indicate that you need more assistance, you know, the prescription then was Xanax. They just like gave teenagers Xanax when they, you know, right, exactly. So I know. So what I'm wondering is, you know, was there a moment in your career, was it early, was it in med school, was it later, where you kind of felt uh, a kind of break with some of what many of us think of as kind of old school psychiatry? Well, it was actually what you got was bad school psychiatry. <laughs> so I was trained in 1982 and 1987. And really good psychiatry is you always think of people in four big circles. Biological, what's going on in your brain. Psychological, what's going on in your mind, including past trauma. Hmm. Social, what's going on in your life. And spiritual, which is, why do you care? What is your deepest sense of meaning and purpose? And that's foundational and has been for a long time. I became completely disillusioned with my profession because it's the only medical specialty that never looks at the organ it treats. Mm -hmm. And as I've been trying to revolutionize that I've been demonized, shamed, mm -hmm. <laughs> called a charlatan, a snake oil salesman. And I'm like, I'm not okay with this. That prescribing medications like Xanax with no biological data ahead of time is stupid. And we can do so much better. But if you look at this shit show that is psychiatry right now, 27% of all doctor visits, like not just psychiatric visits, mm -hmm. all doctor visits, someone's leaving with a prescription for a benzo. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Um, last year, there were 337 million prescriptions for antidepressants. And when you see depression like I do through the lens of those four circles, but particularly imaging, what you realize depression is a symptom like mm -hmm. chest pain. It really shouldn't be a diagnosis because it doesn't tell you what's causing it. Mm -hmm. So doctors say, well, it's idiopathic, which means the idiots don't know. <laughs> um, it doesn't tell you what's causing it and it doesn't tell you what to do for it. And that's why in big uh, studies, SSRIs for depression look no better than placebo. No, I know if I give the right person an SSRI, it changes their life in a positive way. I give it to the wrong person, they might want to kill themselves or kill somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that we can make diagnoses based on symptom clusters with no biological data is just dumb. And um, I'm horrified, but still, you know, inspired every day to make a difference. And that's why we're talking. Yeah, I, um, I think, I mean, it's so it's so lovely to hear you um, frame it that way, and you know I think that 
the, the next thing that that makes me think about, and and obviously you have you have a a, a platform of having some very prominent clients. Um, you work with people with really complicated and, and beautiful minds, um, and you've been able to really help people transform. You know the so many features of their life. Um, I wonder if and and I sort of know the answer to this because I I've <laughs> I've read your books. Um, is what you're describing just for wealthy people? Is what you're describing just something that, you know, we get to read about or hear Miley Cyrus and Justin Bieber talk about? Or is this a way of doing psychiatry that can actually apply to all people? I have 11 clinics. We see about 10,000 patient hours a month of everyday people. I mean, I've been blessed to be Miley's doctor for a dozen years and I've been Justin's doctor and, and you know that's a real blessing what what it does is it helps me spread the message through culture hmm. that we need a brain health revolution I'm in Justin Bieber's docuseries seasons and you know like many celebrities he comes he doesn't he does what I say mostly not <laughs> and, uh, when he went through a really hard season, he came into my office and he said, I think I get what you're trying to tell me. Mm. My brain is an organ, like my heart is an organ. If you told me I had heart problems, I'd do everything you said. Mm. And then, you know, as he did what I said, he got so much better. Mm. And, um, but, you know, I tell people I can help you for free, right? I mean, I have about 6 million people on social media and I post all the time. That's free. Or they can go to the library and buy one of my books. If you buy Change Your Brain Every Day and you just go through it three to five minutes a day, mm -hmm. by the end of the year, your life's going to be transformed. You're going to fall in love with your brain. You're going to start avoiding things that hurt it. And you're going to do things that help it. And if you need to get scanned because you really don't know what's going on in your brain, it's totally worth the investment, no, no matter who you are. That, that's really helpful. Um, I, I, I want to get into some of the practicalities, um, some of the things that, that you actually do offer and, and that are helpful um, to change your brain. But I do want to ask something that I get asked, you know, as, as a, a public facing, you know, person a lot. Many people assume that the challenges that I have are because I've been on television since I'm, you know, 14 years old, or they assume that like, um, people in Hollywood are crazy or, you know, we get all this money and we do all this cocaine and, and that's what our problems are. But, uh, what I've experienced just, you know, as, as a human being, um, may be exacerbated by the life that I live, the the amount of pressure that that I or Justin or Miley fall under. But but the notion of the the core of what you're talking about, I, I just want to clarify, that has nothing to do with celebrity. You're not talking about what happens to celebrity brains and how to apply that to the regular population. No, I come at this, it happens to all of our brains. Mm -hmm. And your brain, the physical functioning of your brain is involved in everything you do, how you think, how you feel, how you act, how you get along with other people. And when your brain is healthy, you tend to be healthy. And when your brain is not healthy, and fame is hard on the brain because it wears out the dopamine centers of the brain and leaving you feel flat and more vulnerable to cocaine. Um, you know, I often say you want to drip dopamine, don't dump it. And fame dumps dopamine and pretty soon you just don't feel right. One of my celebrities said fame is lethal. And, you know, we've seen those stories over and over again. But quite frankly, there's a whole bunch of things that are lethal. You know, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death. It's escalating especially, I don't know if you saw these statistics, but 57% of teenage girls report being persistently sad. 24% have um, planned to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. 
and 13% have tried to kill themselves. These are statistics that are unlike anything Mm -hmm. that I've ever known to be true in my nearly 70 years of life. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. Jonathan, how do you feel about end-of-year season holiday gatherings? It's a lot of pressure sometimes. A lot of requests, (laughs) a lot of people, a lot of expectations. (laughs) Well, a lot of us struggle with seasonal blues and the stress that comes with preparing for the holiday season. It's actually natural to feel some sadness or anxiety about it or to feel like it's a lot, but adding something new and positive to your life can actually help counteract some of those feelings. We suggest therapy, which can be a really, really important bright spot amid all of the stress and change. It's something to help you feel grounded, to give you the tools to manage everything going on, and honestly, something to look forward to as a way to process all these big feelings. That's sure what I do this time of year with my therapist. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Jonathan, what do they have to do? Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Go to betterhelp.com slash break today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash break. Mind Alex Breakdown is supported by Helix Sleep. I've had my Helix for about two years now, which means I've actually been sleeping great for two years. Jonathan loves his Helix mattress. My kids love their Helix mattresses. The Helix lineup offers 20 unique mattresses, including the award-winning Lux Collection, the newly released Helix Elite Collection, a mattress designed just for big and tall sleepers, and even one made just for kids. Take the Helix Sleep Quiz, find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. It works, and your personal mattress will be shipped straight to your door free of charge. Helix also offers a 100-night trial and a 10- to 15-year warranty to try out your new Helix mattress. Everybody's unique, and everyone sleeps differently. Each of Helix's mattress models are designed for specific sleep positions and feel preferences. That's how you know which one's for you. Models with memory foam layers provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side. Models with a more responsive foam cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions. Plus, Enhanced cooling features keep you from overheating at night, which is a problem. Jonathan has told me it's a problem of his. Every Helix mattress combines individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top. It's the perfect combination of comfort and support. It's even recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving your sleep. I took the Helix Sleep Quiz, which is also fun, and I was matched with a midnight mattress because I wanted something firm and I mostly sleep on my side, but sometimes on my tummy. Jonathan was matched with the Twilight, and our mattresses are a supremely major upgrade from our last ones. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash breakdown. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. So that's a a great lead into something you said a moment ago. Um, that depression is a symptom. It's it's not a diagnosis. Um, maybe that's a good place to start. Um, you know, one of one of the pages that really really um, kind of knocked me on my tush um, was I will tell you what day it was. It was day eighty one. Um, is bipolar disorder the new fad diagnosis and um, you know, I, I, I have a, a doctorate in neuroscience. I'm not a practicing neuroscientist. You know, my, my research days are long over. Um, but I, I often get asked, you know, am I bipolar? Is this depression or is it just grief? Do I have OCD? Like people love asking me these things, you know, both on the podcast and just as I'm in the supermarket. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's so helpful about your, your book and all of the work you do is how very, very specific you are. So when I saw that about bipolar disorder, it just in one page, you made clear what so much confusion really is, is about regarding this diagnosis and, and the rates. So I want to take depression, which obviously is a component of bipolar disorder. Um, why, why is depression, why does that not deserve its own diagnosis? Meaning what is it often telling us? Well, it's telling us that you're sad and you can't snap, snap out of it, but we don't know why you're sad. Is your thyroid low? Hmm. Do you live in a mold-filled environment? 
are you a painter? And you're exposed to uh, poison day in and day out. Um, have you lost something, an idea, a person, very important to you? Do you have an infection like COVID uh, that fires up your emotional brain? It's not a, a diagnosis. It says, go find out why. But it's not why. Depression is not the why. It's the what. But if you don't know why, giving everybody who's depressed an SSRI, when you frame it this way, it's just dumb. Um, it's not one thing, sort of like ADD. Not one thing. I wrote a book called The Healing ADD. I talked about the seven different types, stimulants like Adderall help some people and make other people wildly. <laughs> and so uh, I think we need to bring neuroscience into the field of psychiatry. Um, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, I remember when DSM-5 came out and Tom Insel, who is director of the National Institute for Mental Health, basically called it a bullshit document. It was this <laughs> huge controversy. He said, it's 100% reliable. If you make a diagnosis of depression today using these criteria, you'll make it tomorrow. But then he went on to say, it's 0% valid. Hmm. Because it's not based on any underlying neuroscience. In fact, if you're going to apply for a grant for research to the National Institute of Mental Health, they won't allow you to use DSM criteria. Um, so I think it's pretty interesting. It's this war between the American Psychiatric Association and the National Institute of Mental Health. And it just highlights that it's pseudoscience. It's not science to make a diagnosis based on symptom clusters with no biological data. It's ridiculous. There's no, and, and that's one of your, you know, one of your most uh, poignant points. There's no other medical practice that makes diagnoses, life plans, tells you you're going to be on a pill forever without any scan, any data, any literally hard science that way. Not one. And I remember when Justin came to see me, he's laying on my floor, crying his eyes out been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. He can't sleep. He has tics. And, and I'm like, he's got a neurological problem. Mm. And it turned out he had Lyme disease. And, wow. you know, infectious disease, my prediction, in 30 years, there's going to be a whole subspecialty of psychiatry. It's just dedicated to infectious diseases like COVID and Lyme, toxoplasmosis, it's a fascinating parasite. Um, and, but if we make diagnoses based on symptom clusters and then give you a pill, we're slowing down the science to really help end mental illness, to help understand where these things come from. To hear you talk about Lyme disease, to hear you talk about neurological conditions as impacting mental functioning, cognitive functioning, emotional functioning, to hear you talk about COVID this way. You know, I'm a person who has an autoimmune disorder. I'm one of those like super healthy women who for some reason, my thyroid stopped working at 23. And what I now know and what we now know is that these things tend to happen um, to people with certain backgrounds, certain genetic profiles, and, and also certain, you know, kind of psycholog psychological profiles. But what's really kind of blowing my mind is that, you know, all of my hippie friends who would talk about mold and who would talk about, you know, brain fog from COVID, we were all mocked. We were all told we're nuts. And, you know, women whose menstrual cycles seem to be not quite the same, right, during COVID, many of us were told, you're nuts. And I just have to say that it's so validating to hear someone like you give credence to these things. And I, I wonder, why are people afraid? Why are doctors afraid to say, this might be related to mold. This right might be related to COVID. Why are people having such a hard time in quote traditional, you know, conservative Western medicine with acknowledging things that we know 
exist and impact mental wellness? It's not part of their training. It's not part of their experience. They're trained in the DSM, Mm -hmm. which is you have these symptoms, so you have that diagnosis, so here's the plan. I mean, they're really trained in an insane system. But what I do is not alternative medicine. It's good medicine. Mm -hmm. The, The fact that mold can impact your brain and your mood is in all the textbooks. Uh, for psychiatry, um, or the schizophrenia and Lyme disease often overlap. You just have to read the literature. Everything in my book, The End of Mental Illness, I guess it was because I was so tired of being criticized. There's a thousand eighty four scientific references. I reference absolutely every <laughs> sentence that I wrote about you know, keep your brain healthy or rescue it. You have to prevent or treat these 11 risk factors. And infectious disease is one of them. Um, there's a whole group of doctors, integrative medicine doctors, functional medicine doctors, uh, that are always looking for why. Like you said, you had an autoimmune disorder. That's what it is. Well, why do you have an autoimmune disorder? Right. Why is your body pissed off at you? You yes. know, I was in the army for 10 years. And so I understand the concept of friendly fire, right? We're going to war, but my own soldiers are trying to kill me. Mm. Well, why? Um, is it gluten? Is it soy? Is it corn? Is it artificial dyes, sweeteners? Is the products you put on your body? Do you have leaky gut? Is your microbiome? You know, it's like, why? Is your body pissed off at you? And when you understand that, when you see the brain is an organ that's supported by the rest of your body, right? And too often in psychiatry, there's, there's a complete divorce between the mind, the brain, and the body. They're going after your mind, never mind looking at your brain. Or looking at your, I ordered a stool sample on a patient today. Why? Because if your gut's not right, your brain's not right. If your brain's not right, your mind's not right. And so what I want people to take away from is if you're depressed or if you have an autoimmune disorder, or if you can't sleep or if you can't concentrate, you want to understand the root cause rather than give yourself a label of bipolar or OCD, um, whatever. And, you know, why I wrote Day 81 is I see so many people diagnosed with bipolar disorder that aren't. That they have mood instability, they have irritability, they have temper problems, they have impulse control problems because they had a traumatic brain injury. That if you go, hey, Daniel, what's the single most important thing you've learned from looking at a quarter of a million scans? Mild traumatic brain injury ruins people's lives. And nobody knows because mm. nobody was. What kind of um, traumatic brain injuries are we talking about? There's a, a couple really interesting examples in, in Change Your Brain Every Day. But can you give us some examples if people are kind of right now racking their brains uh, metaphorically? What are we talking about that can actually contribute to some of these kinds of behaviors? Well, your brain is soft about the consistency of soft butter. The skull is really hard and has sharp bony ridges. And I have to ask my patients often 10 times whether or not they've had a brain injury. And, you know, I was trained at Walter Reed, so I was a military trained doctor. So we thought about head injuries, but I'd ask once and then they go, no, I'd move on. Well, when you have a scan that shows a traumatic brain injury, no, are you sure? Have you ever mm. fallen out of a tree, off a fence, dove into a shallow pool? Have you had concussions playing sports? Have you been in a car accident? Falls, fights. Mm. And people go, no, no, no. The first time this happened to me, no, 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 no. When I was seven, I fell out of a second story window. Mm. I think that counts. Maybe. <laughs> Or when I was three, I fell down a flight of stairs. I was unconscious for half an hour, went to the emergency room. The doctor told my parents, it's just a mild traumatic brain injury. I'll be fine. Well, I've never been fine. Um, 
is, or one of the guys went through a windshield of a car. Another one, actually a very funny story. Um, this kid had Tourette's syndrome. You know, Tourette's syndrome is a tick, motor tics, vocal tics, and often corporalalia, which is compulsive swearing. But he came in from a drug treatment program. He had a tick. And so in order to do a scan, you have to lay still for 15 minutes. And so because he had a head tick, I climbed up on top of him and held his head still for 15 minutes. So we developed a very close relationship. So afterwards, I said, hey, why don't you stick around and look at your scan with me? And damage to his left frontal temporal lobe. And I'm like, when did you have a head injury? He said, I didn't. I went, are you sure? And then the swearing started. F, no. But I grew up in the grocery business, so I don't really care if you swear. And I'm like, do you ever fall out of a tree? F, no. Um, fall out of a second story window? F, no. In a car accident? F, no. And then all of a sudden, after I did that like 10 times, he stopped. He said, I'm so sorry, I lied to you. He said, I was riding my motorcycle around the lake and a baby deer came onto the road and I didn't want to hit it. So I spilled my bike onto my left side and broke my left jaw. Do you think that counts? F, yes, I said to him. If, if you were to tell me the top three things that, that most people don't think about in terms of being able to change their brain, what would those be? Most people don't think their brain can change. Most people mm. think their brain is stuck. And that's clear in this book. You are not stuck. With mm-hmm. the brain you have, you can make it better. And I can improve it. Uh, people don't think that their brain produces 700 new baby stem cells every day. It's actually a conversation Miley and I had. Um, she's an animal lover, and I'm trying to think of ways to get her to attach to her <laughs> brain. And there's an area called the hippocampus uh, on the inside of your temporal lobes. And hippocampus is Greek for seahorse. And every day you make 700 new baby seahorses, stem cells, every day. And through your behavior, you're either growing them Hmm. or you're murdering them. And nobody thinks like this. Every day I'm making my brain better by what I do or I'm making it worse Hmm. by what I do. And there's a little tiny habit I just dearly love. Um, I work with B.J. Fogg for six months. He's a Stanford professor on how people change. And it's like the smallest thing you can do. It'll make the biggest difference. And it's just ask yourself this question every day. Um, this is good for my brain or bad for it. Mm. And if you can answer that with information and love, love of yourself, love of your family, love of the reason you're on the planet, you just start making better decisions. Um, many people think, Marijuana is innocuous and alcohol is a health food. That's insane. <laughs> Marijuana is not innocuous and alcohol is not a health food. Um, the American Cancer Society came out against any alcohol a couple of years ago because any alcohol is associated with an increased risk of seven different types of cancer. And so, um, Good for my brain or bad for it. Or another one I love is, do I only love food that loves me back? Like, mm. I, I don't know if you've ever been in a bad relationship. <laughs> me? Never. I have been in a couple of, <laughs> what was I thinking, relationships. And, yeah, and I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not mm. married to my best friend. Uh, and I'm damn sure not doing it with food, right? People go, I love pizza. I'll beat you up. I love sugar. It's pro-inflammatory. It makes you more likely to be fat and depressed. I love pasta. Usually it's going to spike your blood sugar. Um, so I really focus on loving food, loving things I drink that love me back. 
fact, we're in this relationship and our society is not geared to your help. Our society is geared to your goals. So, um, I'm not okay with that. You know, I've, my book, The End of Mental Illness, I imagined if I was an evil ruler and I wanted to create mental illness, what would I do? And I have 63 strategies, like, you know, make marijuana seem innocuous. So the level of teenagers using it, which has skyrocketed. My Ambialix Breakdown is supported by Ritual. You know what I've noticed lately, Jonathan? What have you noticed, Mayim? Everybody's a hot mess. Perfection is just an illusion, and it's time we all give it up already. And this... This is coming from a vitamin and supplement company. Ritual knows it's basically impossible to get all the nutrients you need from your diet 100% of the time. So they made this multivitamin that helps you focus on what's important, like filling key nutrient gaps to support foundational health. It is easy and painless to incorporate Ritual products into my daily routine. And I love that they're vegan friendly. And I love that I feel confident about how my body's gonna function because I have Ritual to fill in all those gaps. Ritual multivitamins are 100% made traceable with high quality key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms so you can trust what you're putting in your body. Their delayed release capsules are designed to dissolve later in the small intestine, an ideal place to absorb nutrients, and they're non-GMO project verified, gluten and major allergen free, and as I mentioned, vegan. Ritual's essential prenatals high quality formulation with nature identical choline and clinically studied methylated folate support baby's neural tube development before and during pregnancy, which is critically important. They contain 350 milligrams of vegan, sustainably sourced omega-3 DHA to support baby's brain development during pregnancy, and a minty or citrus essence in every bottle keeps things fresh and helps make taking your multis every day actually enjoyable. Instead of striving for perfect health, aim for supporting foundational health. And great news, tell them, Jonathan. Ritual is offering our listeners 30% off during your first month. Visit ritual.com slash breakdown to start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 plus or prenatal to your subscription today. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Masterclass. We have learned so much about a wide variety of topics for Masterclass, most recently about the science of better sleep from Matthew Walker's class, which taught us practical ways to optimize sleep to better our overall health. This is something Jonathan is very passionate about. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you or anyone on your list. What a great idea for a gift. Both of you can learn from the best to become your best, from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Whether you're watching Masterclass on TV, listening in audio mode, which is awesome, in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes from the world's best? Easily hundreds to thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. Learn how to negotiate a raise with Chris Voss or manage your relationships with Esther Perel. There are over 180 classes to pick from, and new ones are added every single month, like Matthew Walker Science of Better Sleep class that we mentioned earlier, and how about the Power of Empathy class featuring Pharrell Williams and other noted co-instructors. That one inspired me to continue to cultivate my own empathy and do my best to encourage others to do the same. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and your work. If you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders, but mostly give it as a gift. This holiday season, give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash break. Right now, you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash break. Masterclass.com slash break. Offer terms apply. A, kind of a, a related point, day 65 really spoke to me. Day 65 is about toxins. And this is another one of those things that... Um, you know, again, like all alternative, holistic, hippie people, we've been talking about this stuff for, for decades. And, you know, I, I talk about this a lot on the podcast when I was, I'm a home birth person. I'm that, you know, hippie. And, um, you know, I used to make my kids shampoo. I made it out of like, you know, uh, like Castile soap and we would dilute it with essential oils because you couldn't find a kid's shampoo that didn't have all this crap in it that we know are, are, is really bad. And people thought I was absolutely out of my mind. 
and you know, I stuck to my guns and I would make the shampoo. Like I just, I just did it. I did all that stuff. And I'm not saying that I sparked a revolution, but what I think is so incredible, my kids are uh, 18 and 15, is that you now can go to a generic supermarket and find shampoo that doesn't have all of those chemicals in it. Meaning, over the last 20 years, we have seen more open conversations about things like toxins in products to the point that I don't have to make my own shampoo anymore. You you don't just have to get it at specialty, you know, rich person supermarkets. You can get it at, at, at generic places now, meaning this is becoming part of our consciousness. There are aspects of toxins, though, that, that you talk about that m- many people cannot imagine actually matter. Can you give us some like hard scientific like facts about why it actually matters what toxins are entering your skin like your makeup your nails your hair this is where like Dr. Amen becomes you know a lot of people's not favorite person for a minute <laughs> uh, whatever goes on your body goes in your body affects your body and becomes your body and if you're putting toxins, parabens, phthalates, fragrance, um, or drinking them, right? People think, oh, you know, classic drinking bottles. It's innocuous. It's not innocuous. Um, and we as a society are being poisoned by what we put on our body, what we ingest. And people go, oh, organic. That's just for rich people. It's like, why don't you want pesticides in your body? What do pesticides kill? Bugs. How many bugs do you have in your microbiome? Uh, Under trillion. Well, why would you kill them if they make neurotransmitters? They detoxify your body if they digest your food. If they create 60% of your immune system, why wouldn't you want to take care of that? Right? It's sort of like taking care of your defense force. And if you have an autoimmune disorder, again, it's why are my cells pissed off at me? And toxins are a major cause. And I have all of my patients download an app like Think Dirty. Yep. Where you can scan your personal products and it'll tell you on a scale of one to 10 how quickly they're killing you. When I first did it, um, like I shaved with Barbasol for uh-huh. 50 years, and on a scale of zero to 10, zero is live a long time, 10 is die early. It's mm-hmm. a nine. And I'm like wow. horrified. And now I shave with something called Kiss My Face and it's a two. Mm-hmm. And it's not more expensive. See, it's getting well is much more about decision making than price. Um, because Kiss My Face lasts like way longer than Barbasol. And I love it and it loves me back. So it's that mindset. You don't want to poison <laughs> your body. And so being mindful of reading the ingredients. A lot of people read the ingredients of food, but they don't ever read the ingredients of products. And I was super worried during the pandemic because all of a sudden it's hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer. It's filled with crap. And I'm like, well, this is no way to strengthen your immune system. The reason that I turned to functional medicine is because Western medicine was offering me surgery. That was the solution. And um, I've had a lot of surgeries in my life. I'm one of those people. I've had four hernias and I've had all sorts of fascinating things happen to my body that, um, you know, that baffle doctors and surgeons. And um, I went to a functional medicine doctor be- because I, I didn't want surgery again. And I, I believed that there had to be a different way. And, um, and that was one of the first things she had me do. You know, I had gotten lax with products and you know there was a website i used a million years ago and i went back to it and um and it was very painful but i did i got rid of everything 
I got rid of everything that was hurting me. And I'm, I'm proud to say the makeup that I'm wearing today, Dr. Amen, is all, you know, from companies that um, make a very strong commitment to not hurting me, you know, when I need to wear makeup. Um, so I just, I really appreciate you talking about it um, and talking about it in, you know, in a way that's so um, accessible. Um, I want to talk about, uh, I, I want to get you to talk about supplements. Um, this is, you know, an, another one of those things. Like I, I take a million pills now. I take a million pills. I, I take them twice a day and I, I have not had to have surgery. And, you know, I don't know if it's placebo. I don't believe that it is, but I take pills that, um, in some cases are not, you know, th they're not, prescribed by companies that get to make a lot of money when I take these pills. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the, the sort of nutritional component and the, you know, the, the pharmaceutical component, like in addition to the foods that you talk about people eating, you know, I, I take CoQ10, like I take all those things. What, what's the deal with that? Can you explain again from, you know, from your perspective, why that stuff matters and why mainstream, you know, kind of culture is still so resistant to acknowledging that there's a whole class of ways to supplement your brain and your body that can help you live better. So in 1991, when I first started looking at the brain, I became horrified because some of the medications I was taught to prescribe clearly were hurtful to the brain. And I remember in medical school, the idea of first do no harm. And so I started studying the science of the supplements. And in the end of mental illness, there are 286 references just in the supplement chapter. Mm -hmm. People go, oh, there's no science buying supplements. It just makes expensive urine. And my response to those people is, do you read? Mm. So for example, saffron, has 24 randomized controlled trials showing they're equally effective to Prozac, Apexor, Zoloft, hmm. and Wellbutrin. So why wouldn't I start with saffron, which is prosexual, rather than the SSRIs, which sort of steal your ability to have an orgasm? And a lot of doctors won't tell you that. And all of a sudden, your partner feels like you don't love him or her because he, they can't arouse you. Um, and no one's like, it's the antidepressant. Um, so I think everybody should take multiple vitamin. We're in a vitamin deficient society. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone should take an omega-3 fatty acid supplement. Everyone should have their vitamin D level checked. And then optimize. You know, we went through this whole pandemic, and early on, we knew people with low vitamin D levels died early from COVID. They're much more vulnerable. But you didn't hear Fauci or anybody from the CDC uh, go, "You have your vitamin D level checked, and you probably should be taking five to ten thousand units a day to get into the optimal range." Right? Nobody said that, which is why. Um, the U.S. has 4% of the world's population and 16% of the world's COVID deaths, right? Simple stuff that people can do. And so over time, and I own the supplement company, I own BrainMD, um, at least 70%. My employees own the other 30%. And, you know, I love supplements. I take saffron every day. I take the multiple vitamin and I take brain boost, uh, omega-3 fatty acid, extra vitamin D. Why? Because I want to give my body all the nutrition that it needs that's hard to get from food, even if you have an awesome diet. I, I want to ask you about religion and spirituality. You know, it was that fourth circle that you mentioned. Um, this is something that, um, you know, we... we 
we find keeps coming around, you know, no matter who we speak to, we speak to people who, you know, uh, have psychedelic transcendental spiritual experiences. And we talk to people who are, you know, religious people of faith who believe that it's a cornerstone of their health. Um, you, you have a lot of really interesting work that you do in the region of, of spirituality. Um, and I wonder if you can sort of um, I, I'm a person of faith, so uh, you don't need to convince me, but um, I'd like to know what what your pitch is. Why does spirituality matter? And in many cases, you know, I always argue for, the, of course, you can be spiritual without religious structure, but th- there are reasons that for thousands of years, traditions have done things a certain way to try and emphasize certain components of the health of, of a spiritual lifestyle. But what is, what is sort of, what's your pitch for why you choose to include spirituality as part of your sort of prescription, as it were? Because it gets you outside of yourself into a greater consciousness, a, a bigger world. I think the epidemic of teenage suicide is directly related to social media and people becoming self-absorbed. When it's all about you, the world becomes very small. When it's about doing good and being helpful to others, the world gets much bigger. Um, Plus, you know, people like, you're a scientist. How can you believe in God? It's like, well, how can you not? Right? I think it takes way more faith to believe you and I are having this conversation by random chance. You know, people like always forget the second law of physics, which is entropy. Things go from order to disorder, just like my son's room. They go from order to disorder. And so to think we evolve without creative design. It just makes no sense to me. There was an explosion a long time ago where all these random things happened, and now all of a sudden you and I are having a very thoughtful conversation. <laughs> so, no, I, I don't believe that. And if that's true, if there's creative design, then probably this means something and this matters. And my personal belief is when I die, it doesn't stop. That there's too many instances, and I hear about them all the time in my practice, of people having near-death experiences, and they have these very rich experiences even when they were dead. So I'm a person that thinks life goes on in one way or another. And, you know, who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but the hope helps. Mm. And either way, I'm going to live on through my work, I'm going to live on through my children, grandchildren. Um, but I'm not willing. You know, and people go, it's so anti-science. Scientists are open-minded. They're always looking for answers. They're not closed-minded and go, here's the boss of hopelessness. Um, can you speak a little bit to that psychology circle? Um, I'm a, a large proponent. I'm a, a huge proponent of, of psychoanalysis, just because for me it has provided a, a really um, a significant scaffold that has led to you know many other aspects of my my healing. Um, but I'm I'm curious, sort of, do you have one general thing that you recommend for most people, or does it depend? Like some people, I would imagine, can really benefit from some sort of slowing down of their brain. So I'm a person who my brain will tend towards hypomania if left to its own devices. So for me, I need to have a practice that is slow. I need to have a meditative, you know, practice. I need to do yoga where I'm forced to learn how to sit. And for me, you know, therapy is kind of part of that slowing down. Do you have a a general kind of way that you like to go about encouraging people to use talk therapy or does it really depend? Do you like cognitive behavioral therapy? So I teach all of my patients. Uh, one, give your mind a name. Uh, it's based on the concept of gaining psychological distance from the mm. noise in your head. That's one of the days. It's um, killing the ants, the automatic mm-hmm. thoughts that steal your happiness. You need to discipline 
your mind, train your mind to help you rather than hurt you. Have all of my patients write down a hundred of their worst thoughts, and then we take them through a process to eliminate them mm. or at least go into them and flip them. So if you take the worst thought, my wife never listens to me, I don't know that. Um, and then flip it, my wife does listen to me, and then go, okay, so what's really the truth? And the truth mm. is she does listen to me, but not all the time. But if you just stick with, my wife never listens to me, if you don't question your thoughts, you believe them, and then you act as if they're true, even if they're only not. Um, so I'm a huge fan of, it's a form of CBT, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also a big believer in trauma work. And mm -hmm. I'm just finishing a monster study on adverse childhood experiences. Uh, I gave the ACE questionnaire mm -hmm. to 20,000 patients. Oh my gosh, all wow. Their scans have their scans and it's just breathtaking what we're learning. Early childhood trauma is bad for your brain. Um, and so I'm a big fan of EMDR. I move uh -huh. desensitization and reprocessing. It's one of, when I do therapy, it's one of my personal favorites. I'll teach how to kill the ants and then we'll work through the traumas that you had, give your mind a name. Mm -hmm. And just teach you skill. Um, I have an elite brain training uh, course that I'm working on. I want as a consultant to, for the Miami Heat, which is super fun mm -hmm. for me. And I want to teach you. You're awesome. You've been awesome for a long time. How can you be more awesome mm -hmm. by working always in these four circles? That's amazing. Um, I, I hope you don't mind me asking this. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Um, what is your take on the psilocybin and kind of ketamine, you know, in, in clinical settings, in supervised like ketamine assisted psychotherapy and the psilocybin, you know, which is monitored by therapists and guides? A lot of people are doing ayahuasca and kind of having these incredible transcendental journeys. Some are uh, transformative, some are terrifying. Um, where do you fall in terms of trauma reprocessing in the psychedelic realm? Um, I'm really anxious about it, mm. and I feel like I've seen this party before. Mm. Um, Xanax is innocuous, it's a helper. Mm -hmm. Opiates, pain is the fifth vital sign. Alcohol is a health food, marijuana is innocuous. Um, I, I feel like I've seen this. But the mm. big innovations in psychiatry are magic mushrooms, ketamine, and marijuana. So like mm. the street drugs of the 60s were making a comeback. Mm. Now, I think if you've done the right things, like you've really done the work to get your brain healthy, and you've done treatments like EMDR, which I often say mm. it's sort of like magic mushrooms without yeah. side effects, um, and it still doesn't work, then for a select group of people, like with mm -hmm. marijuana, um, it, it can be helpful. I'm open-minded. The problem is, it's the most common question I get asked, and I have a 20-year-old, and she's like, you know, people are having magic mushroom parties, left yep. and right. They're not getting drunk. They're getting high. Yep. And um, I'm very concerned uh, mm. about this. And I remember the last presidential election, Cory Booker, Shame Joe Biden when uh, then Vice President Biden, when asked about marijuana, said, I don't think it should be legalized yet. I think mm. it needs more study. And Cory Booker on national television, you know, a very thoughtful senator, said, Man, are you high? And <laughs> shamed him for what, you know, I think the, the science is clearly not there. Uh, the teenagers who use have a higher incidence of anxiety, depression, suicide, and psychosis in their 20s. This is not innocuous. So, man, are you high? Really speaks to Booker's uh, mm -hmm. lack of thoughtfulness. Um, a couple of fun questions. 
Can I know what you named your mind? Yes. Uh, I named my mind after my pet raccoon when I was 16. I had a pet raccoon. Her name was Hermie, and I loved her. But just like my mind, she was a troublemaker. Hermie used to TP my mother's bathroom. <laughs> Ate all the fish out of my sister's aquarium. What? And would leave raccoon poo in my <laughs> shoes. And that's my mind. It's just like a <laughs> stir up trouble. Like all of a sudden, no, that won't work. Or you think about, you know, and, and so, you know, metaphorically, I used to sort of put her in a cage. I'm like, you need to like take a time out. But now what I do when I find my mind acting up, I I imagine Hermie and I put her on her back and I tickle her because I used to do that. And she loved that and make these funny sounds. And I'm like, come on, we can do better. And I want to treat myself like a good boss, a good parent, a good coach, which is I'm always firm and kind, Hmm. which is I understand this the hard day. We can do better. What's your goal? I ask that to myself all the time. And I ask all my patients, know what you want. We have an exercise in the book called The One Page Miracle. One piece of paper, write down what you want. And then you just ask yourself every day, my behavior getting me what I want. And that's not selfish. I actually believe happiness is a moral obligation. That's Mm -hmm. another day. Happiness is a moral obligation. I grew up Roman Catholic, and that idea was nowhere to be found in Catholic school or mass. There was just a lot of sort of shame and guilt. And and I appreciate my Catholic upbringing because it was structured and it gave me a lot of goodness. But happiness is a moral of no, 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 long suffering. And why is happiness a moral obligation? because of how contagious you are, Hmm. right? If you've ever been raised by an unhappy parent or married to an unhappy spouse or raised an unhappy child, and you ask those people, is happiness a moral obligation? They'll say, absolutely. And so hedonism, however, is the enemy of happiness. Hmm. And if I know what I want, I'm caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship with my wife, then I'm always filtering what I say, what I do. Is, does it fit? I don't have any tattoos yet. Uh, my wife actually got one recently. It completely <laughs> freaked me out. Um, it's our daughter's birthday. But anyways, if I got a tattoo, it would be, does it fit? Does my behavior fit? Mm-hmm. The goals I have for my life. And I think that's always step one in therapy. What do you want? What's your behavior getting you? What you want? I think your tattoo should be a raccoon. <laughs> Saying, does it fit with a little thought bubble? That's right. I got it. It's holding a little flag. Um, the book Change Your Brain Every Day. Um, I really, really highly recommend it. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. I, I appreciate all of the work you do. You're a real warrior um, for those of us who um, who need an advocate who can speak to to the science and also the heart of of what ails so many of us. Um, thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure having you here. What a joy. Thank you so much. If you're watching on YouTube, you will notice that there's been a change of wardrobe as well as a change of scenery. Jonathan was not with me for this interview, but I had so many questions about what Jonathan would say about it that Jonathan has watched the episode and we have reconvened for this outro. This I don't think we've ever done this before. Uh, I can't remember if we have. I think there may have been a time... Um... Also, I had a lot of notes for you during that <laughs> interview, but we won't start there. You know what? We can do a separate episode just of Jonathan critiquing my interview strategy. It will be like one of those um, uh, NBA analysts where they stop the game film. That's exactly what it will be like. I'll circle. I'll be like, in this moment, you should have <laughs> said this, but you led here. And instead of picking and rolling. I did the best that I could with Dr. Amen. I had a very good time with him. I had so so many things that I wish you were there to talk about. So, Jonathan, what did you, what were some of the highlights 
What do you want to talk about about Dr. Amen? Let's go in order. We're going to go in order. He only wears black. He only wears black. Every time I've ever seen him, he's only wearing black. He's in line with Johnny Cash. <laughs> 27% of all doctor visits result in the prescription for a benzo. Mm-hmm. That to me is a huge indicator that we may not be getting to the root cause of what's going on during these medical visits. And <laughs> we've spoken on this podcast extensively about the medical system and, and it's a sick care system. And this goes directly to what he was saying is that our world is designed to make us sick, not make us healthy. And if we understand that, that the products and services, the lotions, the ointments, the makeup, the often the food, the packaged food especially that are on the shelves around us that is quote unquote normal that many of us grew up with never considered that it may have negative health implications. If we start with the sense with the notion that these are not healthy for us and actually they can be designed to make us sick over time. That is the beginning level of creating a foundation for health because you start to question the status quo. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> I know what you're going to say. What am I going to say? Because your face has that look on it of uh, displeasure. I think that what one of the challenges that I have with, with Dr. Amen's approach, which not with Dr. Amen himself, but his approach is very much like feels unattainable to me. Meaning like, we have to stop eating the way we're eating. We have to stop using the makeup we're using. We have to stop using the shampoo. We have to like, everybody needs to be in therapy. Everybody needs to take supplements. Like that sounds daunting to me. If we continue with the status quo, we get a healthcare system where 360 million prescriptions of antidepressants are given. And if that's okay as a metric for how we're all living, then we don't have to question anything. But if we begin to question and questioning what is normal, tie it back to Gabor Mate's myth of normal, if we don't start to question our relationships, how we connect with people, how much we're working, the pressure that we're under, and then extend to what we're eating, the chemicals on our bodies, the chemicals that we're cleaning our homes with and that we're surrounded by, the chemicals we're putting on our bodies in terms of lotions, if we don't start to evaluate that, then we can't make any conscious change. And yes, it is daunting. And no, there shouldn't be a level of perfectionism needed, but we are in a crisis of health in this country. And if we don't start to evaluate the causes for some of this and we just say, well, everything is okay, then no possible change is going to be made. And I think it can't be a, 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 oh, well, this is for elite people and this is for everyday people and people who uh, are able to afford something. Or Everyone can make micro changes. Everyone can eat slightly less processed food. Everyone can look at uh, and start to understand some of the chemicals in lotions. As you described, even in everyday supermarkets, there are natural soap options. There are less fragrances. There are cleaning products that have less toxic chemicals in this. And it's the cumulative effect of all of this that begins to degrade our autoimmune system and cause disease. If you were to name your mind, Jonathan, what would you name it? <laughs> I think it depends on what my mind is doing. Sometimes my mind is like creative and, and being hopeful when it's like analyzing and like, just being, uh, pointing out all the things that are a problem. Um, it needs a name. It's a bit of a downer. What, what's a name <laughs> for someone who's a bit of a downer? It needs like a womp womp name. <laughs> I don't want to name a name because then anyone with that name will be like, my name is the name of Jonathan's <laughs> mean mind. Let's, let's, let's make this a little happier just yep. for a second. We'll, we'll add a little light note. There was a moment in the episode where, uh, you put yourself right in the same category as Miley Cyrus and Justin Bieber. And I like how you just what did I do? yourself right in there. <laughs> what did I say? It was something like, you know, you know, now I forget exactly the wording. Just but it was, me, Justin and Miley. 
Yeah, it's like, you know, how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was about fame. It was about the impact of fame. And I actually thought there was a tie-in there to, uh, you know, because you were trying to say, this stuff isn't just for people who have right. fame. Like you, Justin and Miley, <laughs> all performing for stadiums <laughs> full of people and sellout crowds. No, that's not what I was thinking. No, what? You sign autographs. Okay, in my defense, the reason that I was grouping myself was not because of a level of fame. It was not because of the wealth. What I was talking about was that these are people that he has spoken about who utilize what is sort of called this functional medicine approach, which is, you know, often combining supplement life with, you know, psychiatric analysis with a deeper look at trauma as well as lifestyle changes, which I think is something that celebrity people have often been speaking up about. And, you know, as as Dr. Amen said, like, this is something that is not just for celebrities. It is a, not, not just for Miley and Justin. It's available for me too. And also other people, you know, his approach and, you know, like we didn't really get into the details of like what these brain scans are, but that his notion that many people are walking around with challenges that they may not even know about. And, you know, as you said, a lot of people show up at the doctor, like something's not right. And, I mean, forget about just the benzos, you know, that's like Xanax and things like that. I mean, people, you know, SSRIs, like I don't know the rates of those. I don't think those are being grouped together with that statistic. But, um, you know, many people have have simply been told, you know, to to take this pill and you'll feel better. And it does work for some people. Or it works for a short period of time and then the issue comes. But there there are there are people for whom it it works. Like there's a, you know, full genetic profile. And I think that some people are more, you know, kind of um, you know, medication purists, but uh that's really not for me, you know, to kind of assess. I think the point that Dr. Amen was making, and I think the one that you and I um really resonated with is that a lot of people are going to doctors reporting that something's not right. And many times what's happening is the mind and body are not being considered together. Um, you know, for example, his his notion of like, if your gut is not healthy, you will not have mental health that is cohesive. Or infectious disease. Right. Or Lyme disease or toxic mold. Like some of these R- right. physical ailments are right. being looked at from the perspective of only mental health. And it's like, wait a second, there's a connection here that needs to be examined. Correct. And also those are some things that, you know, people in holistic communities have talked about and everybody was like, that's nuts. Like I've heard people talking about mold for decades in the homeschool community. Like people talk about those things. And so that's also a real difference, you know, of like hearing Dr. Amen, you know, who's a um, an MD, like he's he's a, a doctor who was trained in Western medicine, you know, like that's his thing. And to hear him talk about that, like we need that message amplified more, that there's more going on with all of our health. And it's not a matter of can you afford this, meaning it, it has been a matter of can you afford this, but that shouldn't be the way that that this is determined if you get to be healthy is do you have the money? 100% agree. There was another uh, piece that he said so clearly, which I which I loved, which is depression is a symptom. It is not a diagnosis. Mm-hmm. And so often we stop at the symptom. I have anxiety. Here's your diagnosis. I have depression. Here's your diagnosis. Even OCD. Here's your diagnosis. But what is going on underneath what is the what that is causing it? Or what is the why? Even the language that, you know, we try and use here instead of I have depression, you know, I'm experiencing depression. I'm I'm having a feeling. And that's that notion of like, you know, if you can have that that secondary self observing and saying like, oh, my constant state is not to be miserable. Like that's not, you know, and, and it sounds like, oh, you're just being a Pollyanna to be like, that's not that's not anybody's destiny, meaning that is a symptom that something is not right. And in many cases, it might be what's going on in your life. It might be unresolved trauma. And yeah, like, I think we all need to start realizing this is not like hocus pocus magic. 
The other thing he said that I really appreciated is the brain is an organ that is supported by the body. And we are constantly making choices all the time, whether we are supporting our brain or we are harming our brain. Mm -hmm. And if we begin to break down our lives into a series of choices, is this activity brain supporting or brain harming? That's a huge paradigm shift for most people. Okay, but are there any that are like, mm, I don't know? Well, it goes back to the notion of celebrity. He said, what you want to do is have dopamine drips, not dopamine dumps. And I think that requires some unpacking. So a dopamine dump, of course, is like rushing on stage to mimes millions of screaming fans <laughs> as you, you know, get ready to perform at a concert. As I shove Miley aside because it's my turn. <laughs> and you're, you know, you're in your sequence outfit and you're ready to do your dancing <laughs> and uh, you have your microphone for singing. I'm in knee-high boots and nylons, just like Taylor Swift. And of course, that's a massive rush. You, like there, when, when, And comedians speak about this. When, remember, we were talking to Fluffy and he, he talked about getting off stage at 12 o'clock at night and like not being so amped up from that, you can't really slow down immediately and transition into sleep. So performance, big events, major milestones. Okay, but you can't say that that's harming. There's people who are rock stars. They have to have that experience. I'm not saying that you should not do any of that, but it has to be seen that, oh, I the person has just had this dump of dopamine you're going to be depleted the next day, your entire system. So it could be, you can repair it. You can repair it. You have to put um, reparative days to back end it. But most of the time people are just like, go, 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 go. And then at the end of three months, four months, whatever the tour might be, six months, they come off of that. They're totally crashed and depleted. They can't feel good anymore because they their system has not been uh, primed to drip the dopamine so that they feel okay. Okay, so that's a dopamine example, but I was thinking more of like what the goal would be because I think for a lot of people, it's like, well, I have to go to work and then I have to take care of my kids. And then if you have a spouse that needs to be taken care of to any level, it's like, I gotta do that. And then like, well, I'm supposed to like have a good time. So like, I'm supposed to like work out or watch TV, but then I don't get enough sleep. You know, like, I feel like so many people are just like on this hamster wheel, you know? So. Well, he talks about the baby seahorses in the hippocampus, which I like a little baby seahorse. Who doesn't? And so working out, that's going to be brain healthy. You can have your choice at the end of your long day. Are you going to sit on the couch because you're really tired? Or are you going to move your body somewhat while we know moving your body is good for you? Are you going to stay up and watch that next uh, episode of Yellowstone? Speaking to you, Mayim. Yes. Or are you going to get to bed early, wind down, read a book before bed, transition to sleep, which we know is brain healthy. We know that reading and the eye movement across the page is brain healthy versus uh, brain hurtful, which TV, unfortunately, is brain hurtful. It puts you in a passive state where you're not really stimulating anything. And the reason why people say veg out is because it kind of turns you vegging out. On today's episode, Jonathan takes away everything fun. Meditation. Okay, brain healthy. I, so you're putting me to conversation. This is how someone, to put me to sleep. Brain healthy. I'm not saying everyone has to live as you say, like a month all the time, but we we do have to know what we're trading off. If you're getting dopamine dumps all the time, which probably feels amazing, you have to know that that's happening so that when you feel badly, you're not like, well, why do I feel bad? It's a mystery. Maybe that maybe I'm dealing with some. Uh, terminal disease, the likelihood is that you probably need reparative restorative time uh, because it's an understandable system. I want to touch on one thing um, that Dr. Amen talked about. He talked about us having more kind of control over our mind and our thoughts than we may realize. And, mm. you know, he has this exercise, um, you know, to write down a hundred of your worst thoughts and then literally methodically like go through them and either eliminate them or flip them. Jonathan, mm. would you like to share one of your worst thoughts? Uh, 1929 is coming and uh, oh. everyone has to save frantically and every amount that you do save will be uh, erased by inflation. That was inherited. Okay, so so for those of 
for those of our listeners who may not be following <laughs> 1929 politics, uh, you're, you're talking about you have a, an, an, a general, you think it's one of your worst thoughts is that some economic crisis is coming and that guides a lot of your behavior in theory. I notice that when I'm very stressed and I get into catastrophized thinking, my mind will go there. How would you, in Dr. Amen's words, you know, if we're supposed to eliminate that or flip it, what are some of the things that you think you can do besides like generally being in a healthier place in terms of your diet and your sleep with this particular bad thought? You know, how do we eliminate or flip that? I think it's society is not crumbling. Have faith in society. Have faith in uh, experts who know a lot better than I do what's happening. Mm. Do everything I can to my knowledge in the moment. Be present. Do everything I can to the knowledge in the moment. Live responsibly in the moment. Mm -hmm. And also balance that with enjoying life. Can I add a few things? Please. And I don't mean this to be directive, like, here's what Jonathan should do, because I'm not supposed to tell Jonathan what he should do. But some of you might be like, yeah, but if you do it on the podcast, it's part of your job. But that's not what's happening. <laughs> One of the other things that I thought of, um, you know, I, I have a certain amount of financial insecurity. It, it's different than what you're talking about. But, you know, there's there's like um, abundance meditations, which Ooh. always kind of make me feel like, oh, that's so weird. But um, there's actually a, a practice. It is a, it's an it, it's part of the Eastern tradition, you know, in terms of like a meditative practice on abundance, of really trying to reprogram your brain into understanding that there's a much bigger picture in terms of abundance, and it's not just about wealth. It's not like you have a fear Ooh. of like I want to be rich. We're talking about there is abundance in in the world, and there are ways for me to feel safer on a daily basis. So that's another thing that if this is a particular Particular, you know, fear of yours, um, that that might be something to to look into. And I think also, you know, when you mentioned like living reasonably, you know, sometimes when we have financial fear in particular, our our tendency is just to scrimp. You know, it's always to save, it's always to like not give ourselves something. But a lot of times, like for me, you know, until I actually looked at how much do I spend in a day, in a week. Like until I did this, um, Susie Orman, you know, she has like a, a financial workbook that I did when I was in college, you know, just because I was like, there's so much that I feel like I don't know because my parents always took care of things or, you know, I didn't, whatever, a lot of reasons. But once you realize like, oh, I could spend money on this fancy coffee beverage or getting nails done, or I could do this. Like sometimes just having more information about our finances can also be something because many of us act out of, you know, ignorance, meaning we don't even know where we're at. And so, oh, I better just save or I better just be anxious about it all the time. And I'm not saying that you don't have information about these things. Like your dad's an accountant and you're a very financially responsible person. But I think for a lot of people, like I'm one of them, sometimes not knowing something makes the fear bigger. So I just wanted to add those two things. Well, I'll just say, as G.I. Joe said throughout my childhood, knowing is half the battle. <laughs> All right. Follow us at Bialik Breakdown, and we'd love to hear what you think about the Dr. Amen episode. Jonathan, thank you so much for doing a little, uh, a little cleanup of that episode. I really appreciate your insight, as always. And from our breakdown to the one we hope you never have, we'll see you next time. It's Maya Bialik's Breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. 